find our place this morning. And uh, let's all stand and let's uh, ask the Lord's blessing on the Sunday school message today and on the kids as well in Jesus' name. Father, we love you this morning. We give you glory and honor. We exalt your name, O God. We bless your name, Lord. Father, we ask you, Lord, to bless God this Sunday school lesson today, God, and Lord, the children, God, in their Sunday school rooms. We ask you, Lord, to bless them, God, and use the teachers, God, and to minister to our children, O oh God. Let the hand of the Lord be upon this day today. Let the Spirit of the Lord minister, God, to each and every one of us. Hallelujah. We love you this morning. We worship you this morning. Hallelujah, hallelujah. That's all right. Let's clap our hands to the Lord this morning. Let's let God know that we, we love him this morning. We love you this morning, God. We worship you, Jesus. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Amen, amen. If you have your Bibles, you can turn to the book of 2 Peter, chapter 1. 2 Peter, chapter 1, and we'll start at verse 1. And go through verse 3. So glad all of you are here this morning. I don't know if I said it last week, but it's good to have Brittany and Andre home. And Sean, of course. They were out of town. We're glad they're back. Amen. Thank God. Second Peter chapter 1, and we'll start at verse 1 and go, to, go through verse 3 for now. Simon Peter, a servant... No, I like the way he said that first. A servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ. We are always servants before we're anything else. To them that have obtained like precious faith with us through the righteousness of God and our Savior Jesus Christ. Somebody say these two words, grace and peace. Two wonderful words, isn't it? He said grace and and peace be multiplied unto you. How? Through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. According as his divine power hath given unto us all things that pertain unto life and godliness. How? Through the knowledge of him that hath called us to glory and virtue. Amen. He said, grace and peace be multiplied, how? Through the knowledge of God. And he said he's given us all things that pertain unto life and godliness, how? Through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and virtue. And so I want to teach for a little while from this thought, the multiplication of grace and peace. Amen. Let's go to the Lord one more time. Father, we love you. We ask you to bless this, the word of the Lord today. God, let your anointing help me today and help us today to receive all that you're doing, God, and all that you desire to say in this house today. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen. Amen. You can be seated this morning. <coughs> the multiplication. Sister Melissa, did you get my text? Okay, good. I added just a couple of scriptures at the end. The multiplication of grace and peace. Amen. There is a multiplication of grace and peace that, that God desires to give his people. I know that we have all experienced the grace of God. If you didn't, you wouldn't be here today. And we've all experienced the peace of God. And, and sometimes people don't really understand what peace is. Uh, the peace of God causes you to be settled in unsettling circumstances is what it does. Peace is not the absence of trouble. You know, my mom used to say things like, I just, just want to keep the peace. Just, what she meant is I'm, gonna, I'm not going to say anything because I don't want to disturb your father. And I don't want him, I don't want to disturb him because he's just going to holler and scream and cuss. So I'm just, I'm just keeping the peace by keeping my mouth shut. Well, you're not, that's not peace. <laughs> but, you know, that's not, that's not how that works. If there's peace in the home... You don't have to worry about saying something in front of your spouse. You don't have to worry about whether or not they're going to haul off and say something terrible to you or, or raise their voice and scream and holler at you. That's peace when you walk in your home and you're not concerned about one another tearing into each other. It's not peace. when well, You're not keeping peace just by, by trying to avoid them and try to make them happy and make them satisfied and all that they need so they're not upset. That is not peace. 
But the peace of God is something that, that, that settles your heart and settles your mind, even in unsettling circumstances. He doesn't call it the peace that passes all understanding for nothing. The only way it can, it can be the peace of God that passes all understanding is if you're going through something and people look at you and they say, I don't know how in the world you haven't fallen apart yet. I don't know. They don't understand it. That's called peace that passes all understanding. I don't know how you're not more bothered by this than you are. Well, it's just the grace of God. It's the peace of God in my life. I'm not that good. I'm not that, that settled. But the peace of God is what is helping me. Amen. And so we've all experienced a certain degree of God's grace and peace. But he wants to multiply that in your life. And there's only one way, according to the scripture, that grace and peace can be multiplied. And that is through the knowledge of God. Through the knowledge of God. It's what you know about God that causes His grace and peace to be multiplied in your life. If you don't know that God is good, then whenever bad things happen to you, you're not going to have peace. <laughs> you can't separate the two. That's where the world is today. They can't separate bad things happening from God is good. They can't separate the two. They automatically equate bad things happen, bad God. <laughs> Evil in the world, evil God. Evil in the world, injustice, injustice, all these things, the God that don't care. It's because they don't know Him. They don't have the knowledge of God that so many others do. And so the knowledge of God is simply what you know about God. And it would, it would blow your mind as to how many Pentecostals, how many children of God, don't know much about God. Now, obviously, you don't ever get to a place where you know everything about God. Well, that's why the Apostle Paul said, oh, that I might know him. He wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. He healed, dead, he healed sick people. He raised a couple of dead folks. I mean, there was a lot. He, he, knew. he said, I got caught up to the third heavens, heard things that are unspeakable that I cannot repeat. But he said, oh, that I might know him. And so you never get to a place where you know everything about God, but you ought to know enough about God to get you through some troubles. You ought to know about, enough about God to not let the devil steal your peace and steal your joy because you know, you know enough about God to know that he will come through for you. Amen. And, and God, God has revealed himself through Jesus Christ. There is no greater revelation of God than what has been shown through Jesus Christ. No greater revelation. <laughs> when you see Jesus Christ, you see God. When you hear Jesus Christ, you hear God. When you feel Jesus Christ, you feel God. Not another God, not a demigod, not another person, but God himself manifested himself through Jesus Christ, the Bible teaches. God is an invisible spirit. And he, he cannot be seen, but Jesus Christ, according to the scriptures, is the visible image of the invisible God. You cannot see God any other way than through the face and the body and the appearance of Jesus Christ. The New King James Version, Hebrews chapter 1, says it like this in verses 1 through 3. God, who at various times and in various ways spoke in time past to the fathers, by the prophets, has in, this, in these last days spoken to us by his Son, whom he has appointed heir of all things, through whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory, whose glory? God's glory. And the express image of his person. Whose person? God's person. The Bible did not call Jesus another person or a second person, but the Bible described Jesus as the image of God's person. God's person. That, that phrase, express image, means the exact expression of any person or thing. Image, marked likeness, precise reproduction in every respect. Jesus Christ was God in every respect. Every respect. How many of you have actually watched The Chosen? I've talked about it here. Oh, God have mercy on those of you that have not. You need to watch The Chosen. 
It's an app. You can download it on your phone. And I'm telling you, I, I don't. Look, I'm not saying, I, I'm not trying to put my stamp of approval on everything, but this wasn't produced by Hollywood. Let me just help you with that. It was not produced by Hollywood. It's, it was produced by God-fearing people, whether you agree with all of their theology or not. It was produced by God-fearing people with a desire to honor God. And, and I don't know that I've ever seen a better representation of who I think Jesus is than in the chosen series and episodes. Such grace and such mercy, but such firmness at the same time. He wasn't mean. He wasn't angry. He wasn't mad. He, he, but neither did he excuse sin. There, there is a story, part of it, where uh, people get all bunched up and aggravated and mad because they do take a little bit of creative license, and they showed a part where Mary Magdalene had backslid. Well, we don't know if she did or didn't, but it sure helps everybody out here to relate. <laughs> we're not dishonoring Mary Magdalene. That's not what they were doing. They were just trying to make you understand that the disciples, the apostles, and those that walked very closely with Jesus failed. They did wrong things. Sometimes they even went back to their old life. Peter may not have failed in the sense that she backslid like she did, but he denied Christ. When Jesus was, read, was, was crucified, he went back to fishing. He didn't go back to dope and now because that's not what he was. But he went back to fishing, the thing that God called him out of. <laughs> he went back to that. But I know it's, it's amazing when she came to Jesus to repent. Jesus didn't let her off the hook. He just sat there with eyes of compassion. And she said, I'm sorry, Lord. And she went through her whole thing. And he never said, he, oh, no, don't worry about it, Mary. It's okay. It's no big deal. I love you no matter what. It's okay that you failed. It's okay that you backslid. It's okay that you went and drank in the bar. He didn't do any of that. He just sat there and listened with eyes of compassion, deep compassion. And he just looked at her and said, I forgive you. That's the God that I serve. That's the God that I serve. He doesn't excuse my sin. He won't make excuses for me, but he will forgive me. Jesus is the exact representation of God because he is God manifest in the flesh. So I don't know what view you have of God, but I would urge you to go watch the chosen app. Download it. You will get a perfect picture, in my opinion, and according to the Bible, of the way Jesus operated. Because it, it's in line with Scripture. But you see in Hebrews it said he is the exact. One commentary said it this way. In Jesus we see the personality of God. We see the personality of God. He was walking in the chosen series. He was walking with his disciples and he was going to go to Samaria. No, I don't have a Bible. That's, but we do have a Bible for what happened. But. Not all of the, the disciples got aggravated and said, Jesus, where are you taking us? Well, we're going to go through Samaria. It's shorter. He said, uh, Jesus, don't you know Samaria is where Samaritans are. They're not Jews. They hate us, and, and we don't go that way and all these things. And he looked at them, and he turned around and said, if every time we start something, there's going to be a Q&A, this is going to be very annoying for me and for you. He didn't scream, he didn't holler, but very firmly said, shut your mouth and follow me. And quit arguing and fussing and questioning everything I do. <laughs> oh, Lord have mercy. You need to watch it. It's all the little things in it. But you see, uh, Jesus, he's the manifestation of God. And so what you know about God matters, not just what you read about God, but what you know by experience about God. Do you really know that God is good? I know people say it all the time, but do you really know it? Do you really know that he has your best interest in mind? And do you know above all that he loves you more than you could ever imagine? Because your grace and peace is only going to be multiplied through your knowledge of God. According to the scripture. Grace and peace be multiplied through 
the knowledge of God. If you don't know that he has your best interest in mind, if you don't know that he loves you more than you could ever imagine, your grace and your peace is cut short. <laughs> it's cut short. It's not, it's not effective in your life. And, and so, but do you know that while he loves you more than you could ever imagine, he also places boundaries in our lives. Somebody like, some folks like to call it legalism and, and uh, you know, all rules and regulations. No, it's called boundaries. <laughs> we set up boundaries in our lives. We understand that there's some things we don't need to do because if we, if we cross that boundary, there's trouble on the other side. You know, there were some things, God, there's some things we don't do, not because it's a sin, but the Lord showed me something about it. He said it incites the flesh. He didn't say it was a sin. He said it incites the flesh. That word incite means it stirs up the flesh. There's things we don't do, not because it's a sin and we're going to go to hell if we do it. We don't do it because it stirs up the flesh. It gets the flesh moving. Anytime the flesh gets to moving, you better put the brakes on. <laughs> However that happens for you. However that happens for any of us, you don't want to incite the flesh is what you don't want to do. And so God set up boundaries, and Adam and Eve were placed in the Garden of Eden with unimaginable blessings. Genesis 1.28 says this, and God blessed them. I know we read over that very quickly, and you know, but oh, let me tell you something. You, you, you're nothing without God's blessing. You're nothing. You, you can't. You can't do anything without God's blessing. And the Bible said, and God blessed them, and God said unto them, be fruitful and multiply. This is God's desire for you. And replenish the earth and subdue it. And have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moveth upon the earth. God desires for you to be fruitful, multiply, and have authority in this earth is what he, that's what he intends. Not over the government, but you're not trying to incite rebellion, but authority in the spirit realm. Authority over the enemy. Authority over the devil. And he said, God said, behold, I have given you every herb bearing seed, which is upon the face of all the earth and every tree in the which is the fruit of a tree yielding seed to you it shall be for meat. Genesis 2 and 9 says, And out of the ground made the Lord God to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food. The tree of life also in the midst of the garden and the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Now, while, while they were tremendously blessed, they also had boundaries. They had boundaries. God told them, if you eat of this tree, you will die. That's a boundary is what that is. That's, that's, that's not legalism. That's not rules and regulations. That's a boundary. That's God saying, I love you so much. I want you to understand that if you eat of this fruit, it will kill you. So don't do it. Don't do it. I don't want you to get hurt. I don't want you. You know, saying, well, why was the tree there if God didn't want him to get hurt? Well, why would I have things in my house that could possibly hurt my children? We all do, do we not? You have an iron in your house, could hurt your child. You have a knife in your house, could hurt your child. Why do you, why do you put things in your house that could hurt your children? Oh, 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 we don't ever think like that, do we? We like to put it on God. Well, why did he put a tree in the garden that could kill them if he loved them so much? Maybe God, maybe we need to learn some things in life. You put things in your house because, number one, you need them. But on top of that, your children have got to understand responsibility. They've got to understand what to handle, what not to handle. They've got to understand it. They've got to. It's funny how we put all that on God, but we don't mind putting things that could kill our kids in our home. There's poison in your home that could kill your children. There's knives. There's guns. There's other things that could absolutely destroy you. But they're right in your house. But we like to blame God for putting a tree of knowledge of good and evil in the garden and saying, now, don't eat it. It's going to kill you. 
Oh, God, help us, Lord. Father, let that mindset be changed in this world, God. Lord, God, let the Holy Ghost move in the minds of not only the people of God, but the people of this world that would try to question you, try to place blame on you, God. Let them see, God. Pull back the curtain. Pull back the veil. And let them see how good you really are, God. In Jesus' name. Amen. Adam and Eve lived in a garden of grace and peace, if you will. But that grace and peace had boundaries and had to be protected. You've got to protect your peace. And the grace that God has given you in your life, you've got to protect it. Your peace can be disturbed if you break the boundaries. That's what it's about. There's some things that, you know, it's, it's not, like I said, it's not about sin. But I promise you, it will rob you of your peace if you don't set up some boundaries in your life. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. It's all right to set up some boundaries in your life. It's all right. It was Adam and Eve's knowledge of God that should have kept them from disobeying in the garden. The serpent attacked their knowledge of God by saying in Genesis 3, 1, Yea, hath God said, ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? Down at the bottom here. Has God said, and you see what the serpent is doing, he's attacking their knowledge is what he's doing. What they know about God, and he still does it today, because the enemy understood that, hey, that's where grace and peace is going to be multiplied. There's a lot that goes on in between these two ears, and so he attacks their knowledge about God and gets them to question what they know about God. God made himself clear. It wasn't difficult to understand. He said, you can have any tree in this garden that you want, except one. He said, if you eat of that fruit, you will surely die. I don't think that's being unfair. <laughs> but isn't it crazy how the devil always points to the one thing we can't have? Always, oh, he gets the magnifying glass out. Oh, I know God give you this, this, but he hadn't done this. Why hasn't God answered this prayer? <laughs> Why hasn't God blessed you with this situation? It's amazing how quick we forget. He wants you to focus on the one negative just like he did with Adam and Eve. You see, what the devil wanted to do was put a question mark where there should have been a period. Don't let the devil put questions in your mind where there should be a period. God is good, period. God loves me, period. God is for me, not against me, period. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. You need to put a period where the devil is trying to put a question mark. Quit questioning what God is doing and why he's doing it and just settle it in your mind that God always knows best. I don't care if you don't understand. I, oh, this drove me up the wall. I heard a lady recently, somebody posted on Facebook. It was a woman trying to talk against Christianity, and he was debunking it is what he was doing. But in order to get to that part, you had to listen to the girl. Oh, I was on fire for Jesus. I love Jesus. I did missionary work, and on and on and on and on. But as I got older... She said, you know, she talked about the things in the Bible that she didn't understand, and she would just say things like to people, well, we just don't have all the answers. But she says, as I got older, and I began to read things that did not agree with my sensibilities, I, I about come off that couch and reached through that screen and grabbed her. Your sensibilities? Your sensibilities? Really? That's what you're going to go with here? Your sense of, it doesn't make sense to you, so you are going to reject the God that's trying to save you. I think you need to check your sensibilities at the door. Hey, look, if, your if the word of God does not make sense to you, before you check out on God, I would check out on my sensibilities. And say, God, I don't understand it all. It doesn't make sense. But I still believe that you're good to me. I still believe you desire to bless me and help me and minister to me. My sensibilities. That's, that's arrogance. That's pride. That's arrogance. It didn't agree with my sensibilities. Lady, you don't have sense. Lord have mercy. 
And I, I, I'm not mad at the woman, but I just, I hate that mindset. It's not her. The devil, what the devil did, he got up in that brain. God was trying to multiply grace and peace through his, the knowledge of him, but the devil intervened, <laughs> just like he did with Adam and Eve. She said, oh, I know God's good to me. He's given us every tree in the garden. He told me that I can't eat of this fruit. He said, has God really said you shall not eat of every tree? He attacked her knowledge of God is what he attacked. He said, you see, uh, you've got to settle things in your heart like 1 John 4 and 8. God is love. God is love, period. 1 John, 1, 1 John 1 and 9, if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, period. If you're battling unforgiveness, it's because you've let the devil attack your knowledge of God. If you think God has not forgiven you, you put a question mark where God put a period. And so if I were you, I would get the white out and get rid of that question mark and put an exclamation mark there. You need to settle it in your mind. If God has forgiven you, let it go. Let it go. It's settled. <laughs> if, you, if it keeps coming back up, it's not him. <laughs> If you got a little voice saying, oh, but you can't do, no, it's not God. It's not God. It's either you, your flesh, or the devil. But it's not God. He's not involved in that business. There just ought to be some things settled in your mind and your knowledge of him. Because that's where grace and peace can be multiplied. You're, you're oh, the peace of God. When I know that no matter what I did last week or six years ago, it is under the blood, it is done, it's forgiven, it's washed away, and it don't ever have to come back. Peace begins to multiply in my life. Grace begins to multiply in my life because I understand it's not about how good I've been, it's about how good God has been. That's how grace and peace begin to multiply in your life, and you cut it off when you, when you override your knowledge of God with unbelief and question marks and, and doubt and fear and all these other things. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 4 and 5, the Bible gives us instruction on how to handle this stuff, which Adam and Eve did not do. Eve did not do. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, I was looking for New King James, I apologize, but this will work, I'll just tell you what New King James says, casting down, there we go, mm. <laughs> I'm like, mm. 2 Corinthians 10, for the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for pulling, wait, for what? I understand some of us have weapons for target shooting. I love it. That's not really what they created weapons for, though. <laughs> That's not what they were intended for. It's okay. I, I, I'd rather use it as target shooting than I would killing somebody else. Uh, but, I mean, a hunting, that's different. But they were created to destroy life is what weapons were created to do. They were created to kill animals or to kill other people. You know, to protect or to advance in armies and all military. But there is a reason. There is a purpose for which God has given you weapons. And they are mighty in him. They are for pulling down strongholds. Casting down arguments. And every high thing that exalts itself against what? That's what happened in the Garden of Eden. She knew, God said, don't eat of that fruit or you will die. And the first thing the enemy did was attack what she knew about God. And she, that he was arguing is what he was doing. He was arguing with her. Even though it may not have sounded like an argument or it may not have looked like one, he was arguing against the fact of what God said. And she didn't pull it down. She didn't cast it down. And bringing every thought into, the ca into captivity to the obedience of Christ. Look, I don't care how justified you may feel. You better get some thoughts out of your mind if it's attacking the knowledge of God. 
immediately. I'm talking like split second immediately before it takes root. I, in 2001, God had given me a promise for some of my family members. And uh, I had been praying and fasting. God spoke to me. I had been praying the promises over God, of God over them. And, and, I mean, it was just rolling. God was moving. I baptized one of my nephews. He had gotten the Holy Ghost, baptized my sister and my nep another nephew, and God was opening doors. And right in the middle of all that, my 21-year-old nephew, who was five years younger than me, commits suicide. And I was at Living Way Pentecostal Church in Louisiana, and we didn't have cell phones and all that. And so one of the ushers came and got me, and they said, hey, there's a phone call for you. And my sister... Uh, one of my sisters said, hey, Chad just shot himself. We don't know what's going on. Please pray. I'll call you back. What do you mean, shot an accident? I don't, I, so I just go sit back in the church. I have no idea what to do, what's going on. And so I sit down for a second. And then maybe five minutes later, maybe ten, not, not long, I get the next phone call. I don't even know where they're at. And she said, and uh, obviously I can't recreate this, the, the moment, but she let me know that he died, that he was dead. Immediately, and I'm telling you, I'm not talking about 10 seconds or 5 seconds. As soon as I hung up on that phone, I fell to my knees and I said, God, I don't understand why this has happened. I only know what you have promised me, and I will not let this in any way, shape, fashion, or form affect my faith in you. I still believe your promise. I still believe you. I still trust you, and I will not let this get in my spirit. Because don't you think if I wouldn't have done that, the, ne the, the very first thought, huh, thought God was going to save them. See, I know what God told me. And God continued working and saving some family members. But, and a great revival broke out as a result of his death, to be honest. A massive revival broke out. A massive door. I could have missed that if I would have just... Sit over here and say, well, I thought God was good. Well, I thought God told me he was going to save him. Well, I thought. <laughs> you better protect what you know about God. And don't let the devil get in between those ears. You better protect it with everything you've got. In Jesus' name. Huh? Yes, Lord. Hallelujah. Yes, Holy Ghost. We love you, Jesus. We worship you, O oh God. In Jesus' name, I won't be much longer. The reason the enemy wants to attack what you know about God is because that is where grace and peace is multiplied. The battlefield is always in your mind. And, you know, the Bible said in 2 Corinthians 5 and 4, I don't know if I gave you this scripture. If I didn't, it's okay. But in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. Maybe I gave you the wrong one. It's okay. I, I apologize. But it's either first or second Corinthians. See what these people have got to work with with me? They do such a wonderful job. I give them wrong scriptures sometimes. I don't give them any sometimes, and they still do good. So that's not the one. It's okay. The Bible said the God of this world has blinded the minds of those who believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ should shine unto them. <laughs> Jesus wants to shine his light into the minds of the people of this world is what he wants to do. And the devil is trying to blind them. The, the Bible said that great grace, what, what's the difference in the New Testament? Why were they able to reach thousands upon thousands upon thousands? They didn't reach everybody. There were those that did not believe, but their impact was mighty. Their impact was powerful because the Bible said great grace was upon the New Testament church. Somewhere they had protected the knowledge of God they had, and great grace began to work in their behalf, and they began to reach people that never should have been reached. A multitude of the priesthood was reached that were bogged down in all of Moses' law and all of the sacrifices, all of the traditions and the rules, and they had thousands of them. Wasn't just a Sabbath to keep rest, but you couldn't tie your shoe, you couldn't pick up a twig, you couldn't do nothing but sit there and breathe air. 
They were so bogged down, but th th their minds had been just, the devil was blinding them from what Jesus was trying to show them. But the New Testament church was able to reach multitudes of the priesthood even. Because of the multiplication of grace and peace in their lives, the New Testament, you, you wonder why they could handle being thrown in prison? You wonder why they could look at each other while they're being beaten and say they rejoice that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for the name of the Lord? Because they had a multiplication of grace and peace in their lives. It was just a multiplication. It kept multiplying itself, and it kept getting deeper. It kept getting bigger. It kept getting wider until they were willing to die for it. Until Stephen could say, while he's being stoned, I see the glory of God. <laughs> while his attackers, and he says, lay not this sin to their charge. That's what happens when there is a multiplication of God's grace in your life. You can look dead square in the face of your worst enemy and say, I love you and I forgive you. Because you can't do that in your flesh. I don't know, maybe you have worse enemies than Stephen had, but so far, it looks like anybody here has been stoned in the head with a rock. You might have by your brother or sister when you're a kid, but that wasn't that a, that's just kids, you know. But I, I don't know anybody that's been stoned in America for preaching the gospel. And we get mad when somebody won't, won't look at us or... Well, we get mad when somebody won't just whatever. They treat us badly. But I'm telling you one thing. For the sake of the gospel, God will multiply his grace in your life. He will do it. They were able. And because of that, nothing could stop them from reaching their world. The world multiply means to make many or manifold. Increase the number and the quantity. When God's grace and peace is multiplied, it tends to take over. Let's go to Acts 5 and verses 12 through 16. And by the hands of the apostles were many signs and wonders wrought among the people. And they were all with one accord in Solomon's porch. And of the rest, durst no man join himself to them, but the people magnified them, talking about the apostles. And believers were the more added to the Lord multitudes, both of men and women. This is what happens when there's a multiplication of God's grace. Insomuch that they brought forth the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and couches, that at the least the shadow of Peter passing by might overshadow some of them. There came also a multitude out of the cities round about unto Jerusalem, bringing sick folks, and them which were vexed with unclean spirits, and they were healed every one. Let's go to verse 29 now, Acts 5 and 29. Now before we read verse or verse 17. Then the high priest rose up, and all they that were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and were filled with indignation. Not everybody likes it when God's grace and peace is multiplied in your life. The Bible said they laid their hands on them, and they put them in the common prison. Now that word common means open, but here's what, the way I like to look at it, though. We know the word common. I'm not going to this, do a disservice to the scripture, but here's something I felt like Lord, Lord just laid on my heart one time. Whenever you break out in revival in your life and, and the grace and peace of God is multiplying and you're doing great things for God, the first thing people want to do is lay hands on you and put you in a common place, a place of common Christianity where all you do is you just give in the offering and you come to church and you do your little good deeds. They don't like you being uncommon. <laughs> They don't mind common Christianity where you don't disturb anybody with your faith. But it's when you start disturbing the status quo with your faith, they want to put you in a prison. They want to put you in a place where you don't speak or teach or talk or preach or nothing about Jesus Christ. They want to shut you up because they don't believe in him. They don't believe he's the Messiah. They don't believe he's God. And they don't want anything to do with it. And the Bible said the, the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors. That's great grace. <laughs> That's a multiplication of grace and peace that the, even the Sadducees and the Pharisees and, and the Romans, none of them could stop the church. None of them. And he brought them forth and said, go stand and speak into the temple to the people all the words of this life. And when they heard that, they entered into the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest came. He's coming again. And they that were with him and called the council together and all the senate of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. 
But when the officers came and found them not in the prison, they returned and told, saying, The prison truly found we shut with all safety, and the keepers standing without before the doors. But when we had opened, we found no man within. Now when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these things, they doubted of them whereunto this would grow. They were worried about multiplication is what they were worried about. They said if we can contain this, then we can stop it, but we don't know where this is going to grow. Then came one and told them, saying, Behold, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and teaching the people. Then went the captain with the officers and brought them out without violence, for they feared the people, lest they should have been stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did not we straightly command you that ye should not teach in this name? And behold, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood upon us. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than than men. <laughs> you see what the Pharisees and the Sadducees and all the religious crowd was doing is they were constantly attacking the knowledge of the resurrected Savior. They didn't want that knowledge to be out. They did not want that in any way, shape, fashion, or form to get out into the community. But you see what Simon, Peter, and the apostles and the disciples were doing? They refused to let the enemy attack the knowledge they had. I saw him with my own two eyes. I heard him with my own two ears. That's the knowledge they had. And because of that, they protected that, the grace and peace that was multiplied in their lives. Amen. They would not let that be attacked. They had experiential knowledge of the resurrection of Jesus. And they refuse to let go of that. Whatever knowledge you have of God, it's, gonna, it's going to come under assault. <laughs> it will come under assault. If God is so good, then why are you going through what you're going through? <laughs> if God is an on-time God, then I guess it's not his timing, right? <laughs> you ever hear of these voices? If you don't hear it from the devil, you'll hear it on social media. <laughs> they say it loudly and proudly there, don't they? Your knowledge, you, be, you better know what you know about God. I'm telling you. You better, you better hold on to what you know about God. Because I'm telling you, the devil is going to do everything he can to destroy what you know about him. Because that is where your peace is. That is where your grace is and will it, where it will be multiplied. Let's all stand. Protect your knowledge of God. Protect it. Protect it with everything you've got. Because that is where grace and peace is multiplied. What I know about God will save me in the end. It will deliver me. It will heal me. It will help me. Amen? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we love you. God, I'm praying that today that you protect the minds of your people. God, I pray that... Lord, the knowledge we have of you, God, that it's completely and totally protected, God. Lord, that you help us and remind us, God, that it was you who delivered us. It was you who set us free. It was you who saved us. It was you who was there for us when nobody else was. And so whenever we come under attack, God, and our knowledge of you comes under attack, Lord, help us just like Peter. He was able to obey God rather than men. Because he knew what he knew about Jesus Christ. He didn't let that be watered down. He didn't let that be attacked. He immediately responded with, oh, I will obey God instead of men. In Jesus' name. That's where Eve got in the bind. She didn't have in her mind to obey God. Peter dealt with it immediately. <laughs> he said, buddy, I'm going to obey God before I obey you. Because I know what I know. You may think I'm crazy, but I know who I saw rise up out of the grave. I know who I saw get up and heal my life and touch me and restore me. I know what I know. Hallelujah. Come on, let's clap our hands to the Lord and give God a good shout today in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord. Holy Ghost, we love you, Lord. We worship you, mighty God. Glory be to God in Jesus' name. We are dismissed till 11 o'clock. Come back ready to worship.